Well, as, as I mentioned, say welcome to our, this is our 10th season finale, a 10 year anniversary. Uh, we're so excited to be talking Barry in your career. Thank you. And we're kind of counting and hoping on some Gene Casano advice to us to impart to us. So our first big question is, let's go back to the time. Uh, Bill Hader tells a story that he was shocked to see you amongst other people auditioning for the part. Like, and he, he tells a story. What made you want to go after this role? Okay. So just a little side. Uh, one, the, there are, there's a circle. There's Bill Hader and Alec Berg. Uh, and they make a circle of brilliance. And that is not hyperbole. That is the truth. And I heard uh, that maybe uh, Alec might be in the audience. And I just wanted to say hi, having seen you in a long time. Thank you, because it's one of the parts of my life. And this man is like the creme de la creme of writing and funny. Okay, okay, so here I am. My wife and I are at a, um, an estate planning meeting and we leave the meeting and we go, wow, that was, oh, the children, Oh my God, are they gonna be okay? Uh, did we take care of them? I'm driving and I get a call from my agent at the time uh, and Iris, her name was Iris. And she said, you know, they're doing this show. I said, yes, at HBO. I went, oh, HBO, I've never, I've never done that before. Uh, Bill Hader is involved. Oh, Bill Hader, I watched him on Saturday Night Live for years. He's just <laughs> an amazing fellow. Well, you're on a short list. I said, hold it. Is Dustin Hoffman on that list? <laughs> he said, my agent said, why? I said, because if Dustin Hoffman is on that list, he's getting it. I'm not going in. They said, I don't think he is. Okay. I said, okay. I get the script and my son, Max, who is a wonderful director, writer, Max Winkler, uh, he is in the house when I get my scenes and starts directing me in the scenes because my audition is the next day, only for Bill. And so I go and I'm sitting there in this little chair, you know, the long, uh, they're metal chair, usually metal chairs. Uh, your, your, your grandmother used to play canasta on these chairs and they are lining the, the, the wall and somebody said, you're Henry Winkler. Why are you here? I said, I'm trying to get a job, you? Because so many actors, here's an, a bit of advice. So many actors say, hey, they know my work. They can look me up on tape. I don't have to audition. That is crazy. Because the, the, the people who are uh, creating the show and the people who are at the network they want to see you live and they're not in, they'll put you on tape if they're interested in you, but they don't want to just see you on tape and not see if you're walking, talking and breathing without a walker. Okay. So I'm sitting there in my chair and then Bill comes and he's holding scripts and a cup of coffee and he can, and he's balancing everything. And he said, Oh, hey, Oh, Henry Winkler. Okay. I'll be with you in a minute. And he goes in. Now I'm waiting because as an actor, you wait a lot. So I'm waiting. Then he, I get called in and I start to audition and I'm working with uh, Sherry Thomas, who is the casting director. She's my partner. And during one of the scenes, I ask her to come up because I'm supposed to be talking to my student. I put my arm around her on tape. Bill is watching. And I see out of the corner of my nervous eye, I'm making Bill Hader laugh. I am making Bill Hader laugh. We do the audition. I go, I go home. I think, wow, that was wonderful. I call Max. I say, thank you. And I wait. And I wait. And now, remember, I only look like an adult. Actually, I'm a mashugana. And I'm waiting and I'm getting crazy. And I'm calling my agent, and my manager. Have you heard? Can we ask? Can, can I send an, a, a, a telegram, a, 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 a pigeon? 
I get a call. Hey, it's Bill. Hi, Bill. I've written two scenes last night. Want to come out and play? And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, I don't want to play. If I did all right in the first one, I might, the second one, I'm not interested in coming and playing. I said, of course I would. Send me those, send me those scenes. He sends me the scenes. I immediately uh, email them to Max, who now is in his house, and he's now directing me on the phone pointing out an exclamation point. I should slow down. I shouldn't improvise. I said, but I always improvise. He said, respect the writer, dad. Very strict, very strict. I go in the next day. Now, Alec Berg is there. Now, I think he is Danish or Swedish, but I like to say Norwegian because it's funnier and he doesn't give a lot away. He is so close to the vest. I think it is like tattooed on. <laughs> and so now he's sitting there, Bill is there. Now I'm doing the scene with Bill. Uh, the uh, 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 Sherry Thomas is there and her partner is there. And we're doing the scene, we're doing it again. Bill is giving me direction. I do the scene. Out of the corner of my nervous eye, I see I have made Alec Berg smile. Oh my God. The audition is over. I walk out, I walk down the stairs and uh, there's a young lady sitting there, Sarah Goldberg. I said, hey, are you auditioning for Barry? She said, I am. I said, you know what? Go in there and just give it your all. There is another actress walking up and down the hallway, just putting on a show, uh, you know, getting ready for her audition. Sarah's just kind of sitting there. I said, you go get her. I then go into the parking lot. I have lost my car. I have no idea where I've parked my car. I'm home and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And now I'm a sugar from waiting. And uh, all of a sudden, weeks later, I get a call from Bill Hader who said, I can't stop thinking about you. Alec agrees. Would you like to be in our show? And I said, let me think about, yes, I would. Yes, I would like to do that. Well, it, it, and He's such a great character, Gene. I mean, he, he's a kind of a failed actor, has yeah. an ego needs to be stroked, likes yeah. to get paid up front with no regard to his students' tuition struggles. But at the same time, he's charming, gifted, really no, no, gifted. No, 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 there, there is no other list. He likes to be paid up front in cash. That's it. Doesn't <laughs> care whether you can act or not. There is no other, there's no other, <laughs> there's no other description on the list. But he, but he does care. I mean, he's good at his, he does get it out of his students though. Like he does, he pulls it. So where did, where for you was your entry point into his character for, you know, to find his humanity? Because he is, you know, a very fascinating character. All right. So I went to Emerson College in Boston. I had four years of drama teachers. I went to the Yale Drama School. I had three years of drama teachers uh, and dance and voice and everything is swordplay and uh, farting, they taught you to fart on cue. It was an, an amazing thing. It, it comes in the, in the brochure. Uh, and then I uh, heard about teachers. Uh, I have audited classes. Uh, and then I heard about this teacher in LA who was very popular and who was so controlling that, you know, when you're beginning as an actor, you're a barista. You are a, a, a you are a, a car parker. You make a, you make money. You scrape it together, and you pay for your acting class. This guy wanted his class to buy his art. Okay, so that gave me an in, and then I thought, what would it be like to be an acting teacher? I've taught uh, three master classes, uh, two at Emerson and one at Northwestern. Oh, and one at uh, um, the uh, South by Southwest uh, at the festival. And then I put that all together. Then with the imagination of Bill and Alec, 
Now, I was told by Bill and Alec that uh, in the beginning, uh, he was written as a real bum, a, a real mean teacher. But I brought Henry to it uh, and in my imagination and they went, oh, he could also be that way. And they are so open that they wrote including my imagination. So I was very grateful for that. And um, so, and then Gene had changed from the first year to the second year. I'll tell you a, a, an amazing story in my career. Uh, this does not happen a lot. Uh, after the first reading and I had read some of the scripts, I thought, wow, this Gene is different. He, he must have a different name, he's so different. And I asked for a meeting with Bill and Alec. And I said, look, I'm very grateful. You have given me the gift of my life. But I, this guy is not the same guy as I did last year. And they said, we have a lot of jobs as writing, producing, and directing the show. You only have one, which is to watch your character. And they then included how I felt and wrote uh, the rest of the season. And I, I, well, I just want to say, we start again in August. I've read all eight scripts and they are on fire. Well, we won't ask for spoilers because I'm actually very excited to see. I can't, I can't give you a spoiler because I will be killed. Yeah. Uh, you talked a little about Sarah, the story with Sarah. Your first line of dialogue is you're berating Sarah trying to get her to quit, but you actually do motivate her enough where she discovers her acting voice. Right. How was that like for you as your first way to introduce the character? And of course, working with Sarah, who is fantastic, had the great monologue of season two. How was that like your first scene together working with her? You do a lot of scenes with her too. Well, she's first of all with me, she is a lovely human being. Uh, and um, the most important thing that I've found is whatever fear that I have as a human being, whatever, or, or you know, that uh, I, I was very, um, uh, I was very contained uh, in wanting to be perfect instead of just being as an actor. And to just to let go and do your imagination and your emotionality. When you work with Sarah, she's right there. She is right there. You know, um, she's, she's got her chops and you have got to meet her toe to toe. It must That's be fun. tough though, because your acting students have to play bad actors. Like a lot of your students, it must be challenging because you're basically throwing away all their instincts, like do things poorly, which is what they're trained not to do. Well, um, they are amazing people. Uh, one young lady was in Killing Eve uh, and then has now, I think has her own, her own show. Uh, uh, one gentleman was in the Menendez brothers. Uh, one gentleman, a writer has written and created bonded his own show on Netflix. Uh, you know, um, uh, oh, uh, uh, Darcy is like a trained improviseur, uh, has, uh, was on the good, uh, the good life. The good place. The Good Place, yeah. The Good Place, it's another show, I don't know the name. Um, and, but she is also on a brand new show now, A League of Their Own, and mm -hmm. is gonna come back to do Barry. So they were all, they, they, they could all hit a home run, and yet they were um, happy to, uh, to be part of the ensemble of the class. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, Barry is not such a good actor in the first episode. He has a great scene with you where you basically call his acting to give it everything up. But yes. then tells a true story about, you know, being really an assassin that you don't buy the truth, but you see emotional truth. Yes. How did you, like, view, like, starting with the, the Bill Hader father-son relationship? How did that kind of, you know... You... Well, first of all, it is a lot of fun to be around Bill. He does, he, he does the same joke 
all the time in front of the camera where he pulls like a plug and then disappears. The only other person that uh, I have um, been around, uh, bless his soul, John Ritter was also incredibly physical uh, in his comedy. Bill, if you make him laugh in a scene and it's on you, you can see his shoulders bounce during the take. He is very generous in, um, so it was easy uh, to uh, love this man uh, like a son. Uh, but since drawing on real life experiences and it's so important to you and your character and Barry, I have to ask about Bill Hader. Did you ever stop to question just how well Bill Hader plays a real assassin? Is it a little like, do you have a little fear maybe? No, you know what I did? Uh, uh, it's funny, maybe it's an adjacent question. It's an assassin adjacent question. But there, there are, during the first and second year, uh, even uh, up until I read the, the, the third year, my second question was, am I dead? Did, did you kill me? Am, am, you got rid of me, didn't you? And he would, no, 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 no. He, and his line to me in every text, are you being healthy? Are you taking care of yourself? Because you've got a lot to do. So well, you mentioned, let's talk comedy. I, I flash back that before too. A great line. It's not the first time, no last time, one of my students will be gunned down the street. And then you say, and yeah, you're probably next to one of your acting students. How did you kind of work with your comedy writers to kind of find Gene's comedic voice? Because that is a very unique voice. You know, well, first of all, if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage. So the most important, I, I, and, and this is the truth, the most important person in the process is the writer. In Hollywood, it is the first person they want to replace. So you write a great script, they go, yeah, they buy it, and they say, you know what, we're going to replace you. You know, I think it, on Broadway, it's protected. They write the script, don't you even go close to the writer. So I already had these two very funny, in, in, innately funny human beings the, uh, creating and, and uh, watching and taking care of the show. And then they also produced it and directed it. So they were there at every, and they edited it. So they're every moment of the production, these two minds are there. So you improvise, they say yes, they laugh, or they say, you know what, let's go back to the, the script. Let's, can we do it the way it's written? And you go, yeah. So uh, it is, um, it's just a wonderful um, circle. I, I really do see uh, the creative process as a circle. And uh, if you try to open that circle or to leave the circle, uh, you will be short-lived. Sounds like as long as you have a really good script, it allows you to kind of explore character a little more too. Yeah. Improvise a little, you have a good frame foundation. Yeah, I also think, I have to tell you, I think training is really important. Uh, you know, I always see the country tilting and people just falling into LA wanting to be a star. But I really think that ultimately training, because when you walk in that room, that audition room, you've got minutes, minutes in order to separate yourself out from all the other people that are either waiting or coming in the afternoon or the next day. You have to know your stuff so you can take what's on the page and make it come alive in that room in minutes. Now, as Fonzie, you never had an issue getting women to like you. In Barry, you don't have all his acting chops, like his seduction techniques. Right. But I love the dinner date scene. Actually, my students, I talk about it with Janice. She sees through all your moves, but like the audience, we fall for you. Uh, how did you and the actress Paula kind of work on the scene and your whole relationship? Because it seemed very real and genuine and we were drawn to it. Well, um, Paula, was game. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, there was another scene where we're at, uh, we're at my house and we burst through the front door and we make out all the way down the hall. Now, Paula was a very, um, uh, a very determined actress. And I was black and blue having done that scene over and over again until we got to the bedroom. I, I, I that the walls are still standing. Boom, give me a kiss over here. Boom, give me a hug over here. Boom. It was, it was um, invigorating. I thought the, uh, I think it's really refreshing to see romantic moments between older couples. Hollywood ignores, you know, romance. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what did you no, say? It's a, it's, it was refreshing to see a romantic older couple having a romance. An, oh, did you say older? Older. Well, you are, you are 47 in the show, so, yeah. you know. Uh, but I got to admit. I, I was 72 when I got the role. <laughs> I do have to admit, though, I'm missing the fact that she's off the show because I would love to have seen more scenes with you and her. Yeah. But, you know, they, again, uh, that the, the first scene I had with her at dinner was written exactly, exactly. Uh, it was, I don't know, it was like um, uh, a tango. It was like a souffle. It was like a, um, you know, a smoothie. It was, oh my God. It was so, excuse me, I just burped. It was so easy to do that scene with her. Well, that, and it showed on the screen too, like the, the chemistry. Because again, we know that she kind of knows what you're trying to do to her, and she still, you know, it still works. Like well, she knows your moves. You have to understand. It's you, yeah. yeah. Uh, but with that said, what was your reaction when you realized the season when arc would end with her being murdered by Barry? Like the whole. What was your feeling on that? Well, let me just tell you, it does not say in the script that she is shot. It only says you see two bullets through the window. Uh -huh. And I called Bill immediately and I said, am I, am I killed at the end of this episode? They did not reveal in the script who got hurt. shot exactly. Oh, so. Yeah, they're very clever guys. <laughs> But in some ways it led to, I thought, interesting, we talked a little season two, you have some nice dramatic storylines. You're grieving the death of Janice. Yeah. It motivates you to read out to your strange son. How is it for you to be able to explore new story and character, even outside the group a little, you'd be able to expand? Well, you know, once you create a character and then it changes a little bit and it, it grows a little bit, you get, first of all, giddy and you're very excited that you have this opportunity to see what another world view would be and you're a little bit nervous you're a little bit scared you know uh, <laughs> I opened the trunk of the car and saw Janice's body and I started to weep and Bill's direction was he came in he said can you cry just a little louder I don't know I don't know if I can that was a good one. But actually, the scene that, you know, you, you got submitted for the Emmy, and which one? Congratulations. Episode four, Bill, you. you know, Barry confesses to murdering the person in war. He's yeah. terrified because you look at him differently. I thought that was a really great dramatic, we'll talk comedy too about because it was also funny. But the idea that you were still accepting him and hoping you could pre made a terrible mistake uh, was nice. How did you approach that scene? Because that was the pivotal moment that could have okay. changed everything. Once again, written within an inch of its life and you don't play with that. Two, I think Gene is a little bit frightened that if he doesn't appear to accept this young man, flawed as he is, he might be killed. So you, and that is a, a scene in which um, when I say at the end of that scene, you know what, I'm going to get another ledger. The one that I use for private classes, Alec Berg walked in the room and said, why don't you say this? Mm -hmm. And there it is. And it was to get me away from this crazy person. 
Uh, one of my students, Gina, who, who mentioned, it's funny how everybody always tries to relate to Barry. Like, I've had bad experiences, too. Like, you tell a great story about your son, you know, giving you strawberries for giving you. And it was it's interesting concept of having a character who Barry was killing people and going through really dark emotional stuff. And now all of you are trying to relate to him. Well, you know what is it is interesting? I think it is the first season where he kills his best friend from the, the army yeah. Yeah. and your jaw drops. And one week later, he helps um, Noho Hank, I believe, in the with the, the Chechens and the Russians. And he is, you're cheering him like mm -hmm. a hero. Now that is why I say these two men make a circle of brilliance. One week you are appalled. You're, you can't believe that you are witnessing this moment. You, 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 you stop breathing. And the next week you are just, you know, the, you're flying the Barry colors and you're yelling in your living room you know, because I'm watching it along with everybody else for the first time. That's amazing to me. Well, and a lot of it, I think, has to do with your relationship because they, you do have a generally nice relationship between two of you. Him with Sally, it just seems like it humanizes him enough where we can kind of be horrified what he's doing, but also know that he has a good heart in some places. Yeah, but it's also the way he plays it. Mm -hmm. It's also the way it's written. It's also, as a viewing audience... You know, I, yes, I know that he has a nice relationship with Sally and that you might worry a little bit about his relationships with other people. But it is the way that they put that episode together that gives you the overall sense of dismay and um, elation. And also, it seems like, you know, I wonder how much was the writing, the acting? Do you know when it's time you need a joke to lighten the mood a little? Like, you have great scenes afterwards. You keep reminding Barry, you know, you, you killed someone and got away with it. Is, it. is it an acting timing thing where, you know, I need a little humor because it's getting a little darker or something? Do you know, uh, I, that was my meeting at the very beginning of season two uh, with Alec and Bill. Um, I said, oh, my gosh, there's no humor here or very little. And they said, there will be. Uh, sometimes the actor knows, sometimes I know, uh, and sometimes they know. They come in and give you a line, and um, it just turns everything on its head. Uh, so, but the, obviously that we dreaded the season two finale where you discover Barry, you know, you remember that Barry, you know, Fuchs told you that Barry killed your love. How did you feel when you, that was your season arc? All right, two things. Uh, one, we shot the bed, uh, my bedroom was on stage 19 at Paramount. Stage 19 uh, is where I spent 10 years doing Happy Days. So I got Happy Days when I was 27. I got Barry when I was 72. And we ended season two on the very sound stage that introduced me to the world. So I thought that was um, unbelievable in just the way the world turns. Uh, now, Barry's gotten so many awards. They, uh, I met Bill and Alec at the Writers Guild when they won. You know, you've gotten Golden Globes, you won your first Emmy, Directors Guild, your camera people. It's, what is it about the show and all the writers and cast that makes Barry so special, maybe compared to other shows? One, uh, uh, I will repeat myself, and there are two really talented, thoughtful human beings at the helm. Everything starts with the person at the top. If they're not, uh, if they're not either in tune or they're not in tune with the material, go home. Uh, number two, they picked... The, I think if I'm, uh, there is a no uh, clause in the contract between the two guys and the producers that everybody they hire is going to be great at what they do, but just a, a, a wonderful person. 
And I think that that uh, has held true so far in cast, in crew, in, in everything, in the, in the other writers in the room. I think that uh, basically holds true. Um, and then it, it's like a serendipity. Uh, the, it's like God looks down and, and says, you know what, I'm going to sprinkle on you. I, I, I really, I, I, I think that because there are so many talented people and then the whole project goes awry. And then you've got Barry, because not only am I grateful, am I lucky, am I happy, but I am um, amazed that I'm part of this family. I, I, there, I'm, you, you can see I'm a pretty verbal guy. That does, I don't have words for that feeling of being part of that ensemble. I'm also wondering if as an actor, but we're going to talk a little about your early days, but when you do eight episode arcs, H, the new model of TV, does you think, is that better for you as an actor where you, you do it over eight, you can spread out, you know, your storyline in only eight episodes or stretch it or even do HBO, which allows you to do go further. Do you know what? Um, we are contracted for 12, but the men have decided, the two guys decided that they don't want to stretch the story out. So they make it as taut as it can be, which comes out to be eight episodes. I, as the actor, my job is to fill my space in the space they give me. So let's go back to some of your origins. Uh, when did you want? When did you know you wanted to be an actor? From the moment I was able to reason, from the minute I was able to think about what I want to be, and there was no plan B. I had no plan B. If I did not make it, if I did not become a professional and earn a living. I had no idea what I would have done. My short German Jewish father had a lumber business. He wanted me to take over the business. Uh, my favorite joke is, yeah, he would say to me, why do you think I bought the business here from Europe? I said, Be besides being chased by the Nazis, dad, is there a bigger reason than that? But I wouldn't, I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't do that. Um, so it is something that, and I don't even know how it got into my mind or my body. All I know is I'm doing what I dreamt of doing. Uh, but then you went to Yale, right? From the uh, conservatory. I believe in training. I really think that you've got to know, you know, acting is 5,000 years old. It's not just being on television. I think you need to train your talent because I have used every single thing that I learned at Emerson and or Yale. I took a class where we would um, create in slow motion. I use that very slow motion and knowing how to move my body in the episode from, uh, with uh, uh, Robin Williams, uh, Mork for Mork, where he made me uh, move in slow motion. And I already had that in my muscle memory from Yale. Uh, and what about Stella Adler? What did, do you have any- uh... Stella Adler. Okay, a great teacher, great in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. I'm in the, in, at Yale in the 70s. Our first uh, uh, exercise was to present our garden. I stood up, I opened the picket fence, uh, the swinging gate. I said, here are my, she said, sit down. I said, no, 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 my forget me not, sir sit down, you see nothing. My very first moment in class, I thought they're gonna kick me out. 
I thought I saw tulips. Apparently I didn't, but that was her. And then, honest to God, great woman, great, all of, all of a sudden she would just in the middle of class show her and then put it back in. There was her boop and now it's gone. And both she and her dog that she held in her arm, they, you had, their tongues were hanging out of their mouth. I think they were both on uppers, I'm not sure. <laughs> but hey, I had stellar asthma. It's interesting you tell the garden story because you kind of incorporate that into Barry in the scene where you're taking Barry to the grocery store, trying to, to do that exercise. How now there is a, a perfect example. I literally talked to Bill as the teacher, some of it written, some of it not. I would say to him, you don't see the gum. Where is the gum? No, the gum is at the register. It's not on a shelf uh, where, you know, all of that just came. That was, a, I love that scene. Hmm. Or I would just tell him an actor never chews gum when they're, when they're acting and take your hands out of your pockets. That's what I was told. It's interesting, now, but then yeah. theoretically, if you never had that acting experience, it would never would have come back 40 years later, you know, kind of. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we're, now we're at Yale, but you time travel back to the 50s, landing on the set of Happy Days. Right. How would, how did that come about? And was the studio worried about you being the bad boy? You know, Henry Winkler, is he too bad of a boy to play? Uh, they did not worry about me. They wanted a taller guy. You know, they wanted an Italian. That's who they put the call out for. Uh, everybody that was sitting in the green room waiting to go in to meet the producers and the directors and the casting people uh, were famous. I had seen them all on TV. It was my second week in California. I only had two more weeks. I only had enough money for two more weeks. I decided I walked in and I changed my voice. I changed the lilt and the tilt of my body. And then I'm telling you something, it was like a key unlocked my imagination. I read with that guy named Pasquale, I made him sit down. I was the only one standing in the room. He tried to touch my shoulder. I said, get off my, don't you touch me. I threw the script up in the air. I sauntered out of that room. And at the end of the two weeks when I had to go home, back to New York, my money had run out. They called and said, would you like to play the character? I had six lines. And um, then I had the most wonderful experience. Uh, it, it, the, I met the world. It was interesting because there was one episode uh, where Fonzie was worried about looking cool because he had to wear reading glasses. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and at the time, bullying kids, I don't know if the audience they realized, bullying kids was a serious problem with wearing glasses. I was bullied with that. Right. It had a major impact on me because I still remember that episode vividly and haven't seen it in 45 years. When did you know that Fonzie had become such an iconic character that he, he, he culturally became, you know, so big? First of all, that episode along with uh, two or three others that I uh, really, really remember, was written exactly for that reason. If Fonzie wore glasses, it must be okay. I went uh, up to Richie and I said, hey, look at this, man. You can get a library card for free and you can meet chicks there. And the uh, registration for library cards went up 500% in America the next week. There was a, uh, a delinquent uh, home for, for kids, for boys who had gotten into trouble and needed to, um, to be separated. And they loved the Fonz, but they would show no emotion in their group therapy, in their, in their sitting around. And they wrote and said, is it possible to have the Fonz cry? And Gary wrote the, uh, 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 you know, commissioned the script of Fonzie over the bed 
of Richie, who was in an accident, making the deal with God, mm -hmm. yeah. where Fonzie cried and said, if you, if you make him better, I will do anything for you. I don't think so. You mentioned Gary. Now, Gary Marshall got his start with Dick Van Dyke Show and yes. was in a lot of stuff. A few, but he also went. He created the Odd Couple, TV version of the Odd Couple, yeah. over in Charlie Morgan Mini, directed Pretty Woman. Uh, what was it like learning from him as a mentor? You know, because he, you know, for you, learning from him, comedy, and you know, I learned uh, collaboration. I learned what it was to be an executive producer on a set. Now, Gary is a mild manner, softball playing brilliant man he was and bless his soul and one day i was going to make my first personal appearance in little rock arkansas for the newspaper in little rock i was getting a thousand dollars we shoot from seven at night until 11. they were going to do my pickups first so i could get on the red eye and fly to Little Rock and land at like four in the morning. And Gary is introducing the guest cast and everybody. And I walked up to Gary and I just said, could you hurry up? I have to catch a plane. He nodded. He finished. He put the mic down. He found me. He grabbed me by the shirt, put me up against the wall. He said, the guest cast has every right to be introduced like you. Don't ever interrupt me again. I said, Gary, I'm sitting here in a chair. I'm not saying another word. Call me when you need me. I'll just be right. You, there was no bad behavior on his set. You know, now Laverna Charlie was a different story. You know, they would count each other's lines, but um, there was no, he let you know that this is, you're a, you're a professional, there is a job to be done, and you are no higher, no lower than anybody else on the totem pole. Well, I think about that lesson went to you, Ron Howard, a lot of the happy days, people, Lowell Gantz and Bevel Wendell, you know, I talked about the showrunners, that lesson went to a lot who went on to have really good careers and yes. still do. I mean, yes. Now, Ronnie was 16 when he directed his first short. Uh, his mother um, was an AD. His father was an actor. His brother was an actor. And his wife was the caterer. And their oven was so small, they would make a warm meal for the crew. They would make uh, roast beef. And she would cook half of it, pull it out, turn it around, and cook the other half so that it was ready for lunch. He said to me, what do you think? I want to be a director. Now, he was 18 and I was 27. I said, Ron, here's the truth. If you became a brain surgeon, I would be your first patient, whether I needed it or not. Because I am telling you that I witnessed an old soul in a very young redhead. This guy was wise. I uh, was a New York actor. I was New York trained. I, was, I went to Yale. I read the script, uh, Happy Days. There was a joke I didn't like. I said, I can't do this. What did you do? He said, can I talk to you for a minute? He put his arm around me and he walked me to the back of stage 24 on Paramount Lot, where we uh, uh, you know, did the original first 12. He said, you know, the writers are working as hard as they can. I wouldn't hit my script. I said, Ron, I will never hit my script as long as I live. And I didn't. Well, I mean, then you two went off uh, to do a movie based on a true story of two guys who ran a prostitution ring out of a morgue. Yes. <laughs> uh, this was Ron Howard's first uh, movie and he came off being Opie and, you know, Andy Griffith show. So not exactly the first movie you'd expect 
for the director, what inspired you and Ron to take on this kind of kind of different type of comedy? Ron came to me. He said, you can play either role. I thought, well, I've just played a flamboyant guy, the Fonz, for a lot of years, 10 years. I think I'll play Richie. And so I took Chuck. Then we couldn't, we, we, we auditioned in my house pretty much. Every actor in Hollywood, every young actor came into my house uh, from Mickey Rourke to, you know, and then a young stand-up comic. I don't know that he had really acted before. Michael Keaton came. We read one scene. I looked at Ron. Ron looked at me. That was it. Uh, we talked a little about Happy Days and, the, and launching some careers, but it also launched the careers of a really interesting guest star named Robin Williams. How was working with Robin on the set of Happy Days? A young man, Robin Williams, does a scene, uh, or, you know, a show, an episode of Happy Days. He's such a big hit. They create a show for him. So now they're shooting three cameras on the set just up the street with Robin Williams and Pam, Dor Pam Dauber, um, who is Mindy, Mork and Mindy. And Gary would write and direct, Gary Marshall, rest his soul, a genius. Full stop. And he would say, so wait a minute, we get it? Did we get the shot? Now, the men who were on the camera, who were the cameramen, shot the original Ben-Hur. Sam, Lewis, it was an amazing bunch of people. And Sam would say, he never came through here. So they added a fourth camera just for Robin so that they wouldn't miss. Now, our scripts were 54 pages for a half an hour. When they wrote uh, Mork and Mindy, they wrote 33 page scripts because most of it said, Robin will do something here. But not only was he funny, when we first met, when he first came, they couldn't find anybody to play Mork. No, but everybody turned it down. Wednesday, now remember we start 10 o'clock Monday morning, rehearse Monday, Tuesday, now, Wednesday, we shoot Friday at four o'clock in front of a live audience and then uh, get notes, have dinner and shoot the real show seven o'clock Friday night. Wednesday, still nobody. They bring in this young man, Robin Williams, very shy, very quiet. Hello. And then all of a sudden we start to rehearse. And I'm telling you, I look, Ron Howard looks, we're in Arnold's, and I realized my entire job that year, or that, that week, get out of the way, hit my mark, say my line, and don't try to be funny because I'm in the presence of some greatness. Uh, well, we're gonna bring one of my student producers on, Gina, who's gonna take some audience questions for you. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I actually, the first show I watched with you was Royal Pains, so I'm a big fan too. <laughs> Thank you. We're, we're doing, as a matter of fact, June 6th, they're either recording or it will be on an anniversary of um, Royal Pains. Oh, so cool. Now, that was a great show. Mm -hmm. I, I watched it. I knew everything about it. I met the producers for, for breakfast. Uh, I was so nervous that instead of uh, pouring uh, syrup on my pancakes, I, without looking, I poured the cream for my coffee. And in, I didn't want to say I made a mistake. So I said, you know, they're buttermilk pancakes. Mm -hmm. This brings out the flavor. <laughs> um, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's a good show. I like it a lot. Um, Thank you. All right, so our first question from the audience is from one of our interns, Peter Figueroa, and Hi, he Peter. says, um, I'd love to talk about your other Barry role, which is as Barry Zuckerhorn, the Bluth family's hilariously incompetent defense attorney from Arrested Development. Um, he says, you were in over 30 episodes spanning across all five seasons, and although there are some great moments, um, is there any particular moment as Barry Zuckerhorn that you loved, and how was it playing such a wildly unique role? 
You know, there again, I worked with a man who was totally brilliant, who would run up to you in the middle of a scene and go, you know what, just say this. And it was funnier than the thing you were already saying that was funny. So there was a moment, my very first scene is with the family and I improvised it and they let me do it. I had a napkin, they had out Danish, no one was eating the Danish. So I took my Danish with my napkin and I slid it and some others and put it into my briefcase because later on you have to have a notch. <laughs> and um, uh, what uh, uh, great moment is driving up to a, a, a prostitute. Uh, and I said, are you a real girl? She, I, I think that was it. And, and she said, yes. And I went, oh, and I drove off. You never knew his, his sexuality. I had an itch that I got from an interstate, um, you know, a, a, a drive off or whatever they are, you know, the thing you drive off and you can rest, a rest stop is what they call them actually. And I just itched for the entire episode. I, I just, I loved Barry. I loved him too. So as you know, we're an academic institution and we have a lot of inspiring writers, actors, producers, and directors in the audience. Yes. Um, so we'd like you to be professor for a moment. Okay. Um, what film or TV show would you assign the students to study and why? Well, you know what, there are so many. What I would do is rather than assign them uh, other than Barry, I, I can't think of a, a better show to watch, uh, but uh, uh, rather than assign them, I would say this. Be true and honest about your talent. Train your talent. Be an authentic self. We are bar none, all the same. And if that is true, and you are clear about what your passion is, and you live your passion, somebody else is going to say, oh my gosh, I identify with that. And all I did playing the Fonz or playing Gene Cousinow is just um, be me in the middle of this circumstance that was not me. So what would it be like if it was? So as a director, be clear about what you want. Talk in short sentences. As a writer, write what you know. Write, even if the situation is different, even if you're writing about an assassin and you've never actually there is a humanity inside that character you know really well. And I'll tell you something else as a writer. I, um, the, write, when I say write what you know, if your mother is quirky, you write her within an inch of her life. And I'm going to tell you that you're going to be afraid and you're going to say, oh my God, she's going to read this or she's going to see this. And she's going to say, why did you write me? She's never going to identify that it's her. She's going to say, that's, that's such a funny person. Yeah, you know what, mom, it is. Dad, cousin, brother, wife, um, teacher, doesn't matter. They'll never know if you write the truth because it will be everybody. That's why Shakespeare is still alive um, and, and, and being done all over the universe after 400 and some odd years because he wrote people you know in your family. They're right there, they're just talking iambic pentameter. Well, uh, this is, uh, we're wrapping up, so let me bring Ellie and Sonia or other producers onto screen. Yes. For finale. Uh, as I mentioned in the opening, this is our 10th season finale. This is the last script of screen for two of our producers, Ellie and Sonia, who are graduating in June. <gasps> Congratulations. Uh, uh, Gina and I and Henry wanted to say thank you. We'll miss your brainstorming sessions we've done this past couple of years in Zoom. We'll miss, I'll miss your Gene type advice you gave me to draw my personal truth to do these Q and A's. 
I will miss you guys stopping me from uh, saying really dumb questions. Uh, you've been a joy to work with and the Pollock Theater will not be the same without you too. Uh, so I also wanna thank Henry for joining us for our season finale and coming to talk to us for uh, Ellie and Sonia's finale too. Well, you know what? I First of all, I'm so happy you invited me. Second, I hope everybody who is watching, you stay healthy, um, get vaccinated, uh, and I hope that your family is healthy and that you have the most wonderful summer. And I'm so proud to be the finale of the 10th year. And to all of you graduates, the anticipatory fear that you have about entering the world is worse than the actuality because believe it or not, there is a place for you. Your job is to figure out your place. That's your job. Once you do that, the world is yours. Well, thank you, Henry. And of course, hopefully when we're back in person, we like to have you up and, you know, bring, you know, do whatever, we will show whatever movie you want to show and have a conversation or a TV. Sure, it would be my pleasure. Well, thank you so much. And I will, you know, we'll see you all again, you know, next year.